Welcome back to the Better Late Than Never podcast. Happy Easter if you celebrate Easter. Happy Sunday. It is April the 17th. It is uh it has been a pretty beautiful day over here. It's still sun's still out, starting to get into some sunset action going on, but it's been a beautiful super polleny day. The pollen is it's not crazy, crazy, but it's definitely coming down. Spring has definitely decided, hey, you know what? I'm here now. Winter was hanging on. Winter was like clinging as hard as it could. And then spring said, you know what? Nah, nah. Get out of here. Get out of here, bro. It's my turn. That reminds me of, um, I don't know if anyone has ever seen this. I'm sure someone has. There was an old cartoon um, that I used to really enjoy called to spring i believe it was called i'm actually gonna look it up right now um it was one of my favorite cartoons growing up and it was um it was a cartoon made in the in 1936 it's about nine minutes long uh it's just a i think it came out around the time technicolor was the first thing like when it was first starting and it was made by uh happy harmonies and it's just it's just a really really great animated short. Um, you could probably find it on YouTube. So, to spring, I love that. I love that. And uh, every time spring comes along, I just it's tradition. I watch that cartoon. Um, so I'll probably watch it after I do this actually. But um, this the past uh, couple weeks have been pretty pretty turbulent. Actually, they've been very a lot of things happened and not a lot of things happened comparatively, but a lot of things happened. So this might turn into a pretty long, um, episode, but you know, it's a podcast. So, so I guess the first thing is, um, not too long ago, I had a family member, um, pass away and I was having a, a tough time, dealing with my emotions towards the funeral, my feelings towards um, my family, my feelings towards myself and my ability to just sort of address the feelings I was having. And um, I, during that time, I had to do a lot of, you know, with the help of friends and family, um, I basically allowed myself to feel vulnerable. And that's something that has always been pretty difficult for me to do, um, just as a person. Um, I think that I don't I don't want to say it's a male thing necessarily, because I don't want to put all men into this sort of box like, oh, like I'm a man, so therefore I speak for all men. I, I don't. Um, but... I kind of grew up knowing, kind of knowing how to be vulnerable, but not allowing myself to be vulnerable because being vulnerable forces you to engage with emotions that you probably don't want to deal with, or you don't think that you should have to deal with them or that you're afraid to deal with them, or you think you're above dealing with them. And through that experience of, you know, losing that family, that family member and, um, speaking with other family members and speaking with friends and doing things like that. Um, I basically allowed myself to be vulnerable and I cried. I cried. I cried more than I've cried in a really, really long time. Um, You know, I've had a number of family members pass away in a relatively short period of time. And, you know, I've cried and I I suppose just based on those experiences, I felt like I don't want to allow myself to feel this vulnerable again. I don't want to allow myself to feel sad. Um, But you need to feel sad. You need to feel vulnerable. You need to feel those emotions because the more you try to bottle them up and keep them inside not only is it going to fester but it's going to affect 
your ability to relate to other people and your interaction with other people. Um, so, you know, I cried before the funeral. I cried during the funeral. I cried. And I, I, I really, I, I, as sad as the circumstance was, I enjoyed crying. I enjoyed being vulnerable especially because I could be vulnerable around my family and I could be vulnerable around my friends and I could comfort other people who were feeling vulnerable and who were going through the exact same, or maybe not the exact same, but similar range of emotions as I was going through. And that was a pretty big eye-opening thing. Um, you know, my, my relationship with my family has always been good, to decent i don't i don't dislike anyone in my family um i i love everyone in my family i get along or relate to certain people more so than other people in my family um but just being around them and just being able to let myself be vulnerable now everyone's family situation is different everyone has different dynamics with their family members and things like that um but i feel like this is probably not the best analogy, but the only thing that can come into my head right now is it's good when a family can cry together. It's good when a family can laugh together and it's good when a family can cry together because that those range of emotions and that vulnerability brings you closer. Um, and closeness is not a sign of weakness. I think there have been periods through my life where I felt like being close to people, being vulnerable, sharing your emotions, showing emotions was a sign of weakness. Um, and that's that couldn't be further than the truth. That couldn't be further than the truth. Being vulnerable and indulging those emotions and being empathetic towards other people who are experiencing the same thing. Or even if you're not, even if you're having trouble with empathy, just being sympathetic, just trying to understand. That shows genuine strength, in my opinion. That's true. That's true strength. Um, so that, that was a big eye-opening thing. And, you know, I've, I've made a resolution for myself that um, I'm going to be more honest. I'm going to let myself be more vulnerable and not run away from emotions that I feel. Um, I think both, there's a lot of people who say this, but the two people who come to mind right now are um, David Goggins or Goggins. I think he pronounces it Goggins, David Goggins and Jordan Peterson. Um, specifically in this context, David Goggins in the sense of, you know, facing your suffering. We all suffer. Suffering is just, you know, it's a part of life. And whether you face that suffering and you tackle it and you rustle it to the ground and you let it know, you, you overpower and you say, I'm not going to let you control me. Or you run from that, that suffering and you let it chase you down and it's never going to get tired. It's never going to leave you alone. And it's, it's just going to get worse and worse. Um, Facing that suffering is how you grow as a person. It's how you develop yourself. It's how you come out on the other side a better person. Um, and for me, my suffering was wanting to avoid suffering. My suffering was avoiding suffering and running away from suffering and not persevering through a difficult time and not letting myself indulge the emotions um, that were inside of me and not letting myself show them. Um, you know, it's, it's one thing to handle grief by yourself and that's a really tough, difficult thing. And it's another thing to share your grief with other people who are also grieving or other people who have gone through similar grief or even people who don't understand your grief, but are willing to hear you out and willing to be sympathetic towards you or empathetic or willing to try to help you navigate your grief in a healthy manner. Um, that, that's such a, that's such a, in my opinion, it's, it's a, it's a much more profound 
process. It's a much more profound experience. And not only, you know, other people helping you in that regard, but you helping other people, you helping other people get through their grief, get through their suffering. It helps you understand your own suffering better. And it helps you understand other ways that you can cope with your own suffering. Um, you know, I was, um, when I was speaking with a very, very dear friend of mine, um, they suggested, Hey, why don't you, you know, you're feeling this way because you feel disconnected and you're, you feel like you don't, you, well, my issue specifically was, um, this family member passed away and I felt like I didn't know them. I felt like I never really got to know them and it was too late. They're gone now. And I'll never really get to know them other than just stories other people would tell me. Um, and they suggested, hey, why don't you write a letter to that person? Obviously, you're not going to send it, but write a letter and just express the things that you feel. Um, you know, just to kind of have some outlet that you can you can express yourself. Um, and it's funny because that's, that sort of advice is something I told someone else to do who was having a very difficult time, um, with a, another circumstance. And I said, why don't you write a letter to this person? Don't send it, but write a letter and just get all of this out. Um, keep a journal, but you know, write a letter. And it's funny how, you know, we're helping when you're trying to help someone else with their suffering and with their issues, you come up with these ideas, these things they can do to help themselves. But when you're suffering and you're going through the the trenches and, you know, it's storming in your neck of the woods, you forget everything that you forget all these things. You forget like, oh, that's right. This is a way I can help myself. This is a way I can, you know, but that also means not completely relying on tricks or external techniques or alternate routes at the end of the day those things will help but at the end of the day you have to face that suffering you have to look it in the eyes and not shy away and just take it for what it is because if you don't it's just gonna it's gonna fester and it's just gonna keep manifesting into other things that could could limit your experiences going forward or ruin experiences, future experiences. Um, I think about, you know, relationship situations where, um, you know, we, we, we have bad relationships, have negative experiences and negative emotions that we either don't express to the other person. We're not, we don't get the opportunity to, or for whatever reason, we just don't, we can't let go of these feelings. And instead of tackling them, understanding why we feel this way, why this person makes us feel this way, why we, why we feel this way, whether it's the other person or ourselves, um, instead of tackling those things and just facing it, we, we carry that on to the next relationship. And then that relationship fails. And then we, we collect more negative energy and we just keep passing it on and on and on. And, you know, you have to, there's so, there's so many thoughts on that. I think what it really comes down to is being able to forgive yourself, being able to forgive the other person. Um, forgiveness is, forgiveness is a really powerful thing. Um, I don't think we, I, I, it seems like, and I, I don't want to generalize but it seems like our culture is drifting away from that, where we don't want to forgive anybody, where we hold people accountable for stuff that is so far removed from who they are. Um, that's why I personally don't, I don't personally indulge or believe in um, cancel culture because we're all make mistakes and we all are in the spot that we're in, but who you were, if let's say you're, you're 27 years old listening to this, you at 27 is a totally different person than you at 16, than you at 14, than you at, at, at 22. And then you at 25, if you're 27, you're a different person than you were at 25. 
if you're listening to this and you're 16 years old, well, you're different than what you were when you were 13 years old. And you're different from from what you were when you were 11. And I guarantee you, when you're 18, you're going to be pretty different from who you were when you were 16. And you're when you turn 25, you're going to be way different than who you were when you were 18. We We change over time. So forgiveness and just forgiving yourself and forgiving other people. But also understanding, you know, nobody's perfect. I'm not perfect. I've made a lot of mistakes um with my with my interactions with people with interactions with family with interactions with friends with interactions in uh, romantic situations um and it's so easy to project our insecurities onto other people and say well it's their problem they're the problem they're the issue no 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 some people everyone has issues but you have to think about what your issues are as well. It's, it's a, it's in a lot of ways, it's a 50, 50. And it seems like I don't, like I said, I, I live just for context. I live under a rock. I don't know what's going on. Most of, I, I get media. Sometimes I check to see what's happening in the world sometimes, but I don't, you know, I live under a rock, but it seems to me like, our culture is shifting more towards this idea of never forgive and you're perfect. Everyone else is just a hater. Everyone else is hating on you. You're perfect the way you are. There's nothing wrong with you. You have nothing to work on. And it's like, no, no, no. We all have things we need to work on. We can all be better versions of ourselves. And a big part of that is learning to forgive ourselves and forgive other people. But to forgive ourselves, we have to recognize that we have faults. And to forgive other people, the same thing of recognizing just like yourself, other people have faults, but they change over time. They get better. Um, so that, that was just a... a a thing that was just a sort of revelation I had. Um, so let's say that happened in week one, right? It's because I said the last couple of weeks have been pretty turbulent. Then week two, so um, this week, um, yeah. So this week, this actually, so this this occurred on Thursday. The so I'm going to kind of lead up to the events of what causes what what caused this event that happened on thursday excuse me so let's talk about marijuana <laughs> let's talk about thc marijuana reefer weed ganja so i first um i first smoked weed when i was 18 i had just turned 18 and I was pretty fresh out of high school, about to go into college. And I was at um, a an acquaintance's birthday party. And the first thing I smoked out of was uh, a GB. And I was, you know, some people say the first time they smoke weed, they don't get high. I was high. I was very, very high. And... I was so high that I couldn't, I couldn't comprehend what was happening around me. I was, I was hearing things. I was hearing things that weren't really, ha weren't sounds. Like I'd be like, you hear that? And no, people are like, no, I don't hear anything. I was hearing things and I really, I could not focus and I couldn't really comprehend what was happening around me. Like it just, I just didn't know what was going on. Um, but I attributed that to, well, that's just what being high is like. And it's my first time I'm hanging out with people who've smoked weed for a very long time. So I'm just figuring, well, I, this is my first time. So I don't know. So this is just, you know, no big deal. Um, so it was just a very, it was very disorienting to be quite honest. It wasn't that pleasurable. I didn't really enjoy it it was it was sort of just like i just feel disoriented i didn't hate the experience but it was just like i'm just i'm dizzy i don't 
I'm hearing things. I feel like I'm seeing things and I don't, I don't know what's happening. So after that, I've, you know, throughout college up till, I mean, pretty much up till I must say I'm 28 years old. So up till about 26 ish, I would smoke weed here and there somewhat frequently, somewhat not. In my early 20s, I went through a Rastafarian phase. So at that point, I was smoking weed fairly in. I was smoking weed frequently, but in small quantities. And the reason for that was because I was getting, I was realizing a pattern. Every single time I smoked weed and got high, the disorientation was getting worse and worse i would smoke weed with people who were my friends and we would get together i I would get high and then i'd start getting suspicious my anxiety would start to go up and i'm around people i've known for years and i would just start getting anxious i just start thinking just really negative things about them and very suspicious things because I would think they were thinking negatively of me. Um, the the hallucinating was starting to get a little worse. I was starting to sort of see things that I wasn't sure if it was really happening or not. It was getting to the point where I could not comprehend what was going on around me. The um, auditory issue was becoming a thing where I was hearing not very not very distinctly but i was starting to hear things that i was like i don't know if that really happened you know at the time when i was you know i was living at home uh and i still live at home but i was living at home and i would think that my mom was calling me and my mom wasn't even home and so that was becoming and and the more and more i did it the worse it was getting and It got to a point where um, there was a point where I had, I was having like panic attacks from getting high. I would smoke weed. And and when I say smoke weed, I'm not taking bong rips. This isn't hitting a GB. This is taking like one or two small puffs out of a pipe or one or two small puffs of a joint. So this is very, very small amounts of THC. And when I say a puff, I don't mean like a full draw. I'm talking like like a, two puffs. So that had been happening for years. And for, for the longest time, I thought, well, I'm just super sensitive to it. Or this is what being high is supposed to feel like. And I just don't know how to handle it. Because I would t- explain my experiences to other people. And they, you know, other people who smoke weed pretty regularly and they would be like, no, that doesn't happen to me. I don't really hear anything. I don't really see anything. I just sort of wind down and just chill and just, you know, and I was like, you don't feel any, you don't know. You don't feel like you don't know what's going on. It's like, no, they always know what's happening for the most part. I mean, if they get really, really high, then they're like, oh my God. But, you know, so there came around age 26, I think it was when I just said, you know what, I don't want to smoke weed anymore. And around that time, maybe I was a little younger, maybe around 25-ish. Uh, yeah, about 25. I started using CBD. Um, now, I personally very much prefer CBD over THC entirely. And... You know, CBD has had a very positive impact on my life, and I'll explain why shortly. Um, so I'm in my mid 20s, and it's getting to the point where any amount of THC is becoming an issue. And around this time, I'm using uh, CBD, usually smoking CBD flour. Or I'm using a CBD capsule or something like that. But what I'm using at that time are uh, full spectrum. Full spectrum meaning it contains all of the cannabinoids and then a certain amount of THC. Whereas broad spectrum has all of the cannabinoids and no THC. And then isolate is just CBD and no other cannabinoids. Um, 
So, you know, THC is a cannabinoid, CBC, CBG, CBN, all that stuff. Those are all cannabinoids. CBD is a cannabinoid. So, full spectrum, everything broad, everything but C, uh, THC, isolate just CBD. So, that small amount of THC, it was helping a lot, but I still... I still felt like I couldn't focus all the time. I still felt like my attention was getting dragged here or there. And I was having some difficulties with motivation. It was getting difficult for me to stay motivated to do things because I would, I would think I would have like an, my, my imagination would think of the thing I want to do. And then some negative internal talk would just talk me out of doing it. And that was a little infrequently, but it would still happen while I was using this full spectrum CBD tincture that has a small amount of THC or when I was smoking the CBD flower, which has some THC because it's flower and you can't really control how much THC is in flower. So, um, this year, so let's, so I'm 28 and, um, I get a hold of some THC gummies and I think okay and the, these gummies are only 15 milligrams so I think okay I don't know why THC affects me this way but I want to figure it out I want to know what it is that causes this to happen to me so I decide okay I'm gonna try this THC gummy and just see what happens. I'm going to try it in a certain circumstance. Like maybe if I come at it with a more positive mindset. Or maybe if I, you know, exercise or whatever. Maybe I'll feel better. I don't know. Um, so I try it. So I'm going to take a quick sip of ginger ale. And then some water. Alright, so I try it. And the same thing happens where, so to describe the sensation, so I should describe how it gets worse and worse. As I get older and I tried THC, I would find that my anxiety would start to get very, very intolerable. It would, it would be like just this very negative internal talk like voices it's it, it's almost always my own voice or it's an indistinguishable voice but it's always very negative you're a loser you 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 you're just very negative stuff um and you know you're a loser you dropped out of college you you only have this one degree that you can't even use uh, you still live with your mom, you duh, 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 this, that, and you just a bunch of stuff. Um, and I would start to get jittery, like my hands, I couldn't control my hands. I would start shaking a lot. My, I would start getting tremors deep inside, like my, 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 um, it's almost like my central nervous system is just, 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 uh, just tr trembling. And I just, it gets to a point where I just can't, I can't get the voices out of my, I can't pull myself out of that spot until I start to come down. So it's earlier this year. I forget when this was, I think maybe sometime in, we're in April. So maybe sometime in like February, maybe January. I don't know. Um, I try this THC gummy and the same thing happens. Same thing happens. And I only ate half of it. So I had maybe seven milligrams of THC in my system. And I'm, I'm just having a really, really bad time. And, and it lasts a long time. It's lasting like damn near up to five hours. To the point where it's like three in the morning. And I'm, I, I eat the gummy around like 10 o'clock. And I'm just having the worst time until damn near three in the morning. Um, so I said, all right, okay. So that, that settles it. Like in no capacity can I have THC, but I have one last hypothesis, one last thing I want to try. 
not because I want to try CB, uh, T, uh, THC, but I want to learn why I react this way. So I try, and th now this is what happened on Thursday. I bought some CBD THC gummies. So it's cut with CBD and THC. And it's three to one. So three parts CBD, one part THC. If you don't know, C THC is a hallucinogen. It is a hallucinogenic compound. And CBD is, it, it, it's a, essentially can be used as an antipsychotic, but basically it blocks your uh, endocannabinoid system's um, receptors so that the THC will not interact with them. So I think that's the basic science behind it. Basically, CBD will is very good for anti-anxiety, anti-inflammation, anti-insomnia. It helps calm you down. THC in, in more or less ramps you up. It can calm you down, but it, 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 it varies. Because it's a hallucinogen, the effect is going to vary. Just like, you know, if, you do, if this guy does mushrooms, he's going to have a different reaction than the other guy. You know, it, it's different. But CBD, in general, from what I understand, for most people, is a, for lack of a better term, antipsychotic, like, anti-anxiety, whatever. You get the point. So, Thursday, I buy these, these CBD THC gummies. And I try them. And it's around 10 o'clock. And, let's say, I, let's say I ate them around 10. So, around 12 o'clock they hit and I only have one of these gummies and I basically had what what I could only describe as a psychotic episode um I I the 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 anxiety was was peaking um my hands were trembling I could the, the the negative internal talk was screaming at me. I could not focus on anything. I couldn't remember anything. I put my cell phone I was in my room. I put my cell phone down on my bed and I couldn't find my cell phone. I couldn't remember where I put it. I couldn't remember anything. And but I made a point that I was going to record everything that happened. So log it. So write it all down. Write down everything that I could. So I at least could type. Like I was typing everything. Because I, I, I can type way faster than I can write. So I tried to just. I tried some strategies I had learned. To try to cope with this. So I did some exercising. That helped for a second. Um, I tried listening to music. That only helped for a second. And while I'm doing these things, while I'm listening to music, that internal voice, the, that, that, that negative internal talk is just too loud to the point where I can't even indulge the music. Because while I'm hearing this music in my ears, this internal talk is in my mind and it just will not go away. I tried. So I said, OK, let me just lay down. I, I, I got on my bed. I tried meditating. Meditation helped a little bit, but I just couldn't shake off that inter, that anxiety. I just couldn't shake off the anxiety. It was lessened for a sec, then it would rise again. Then it would lessen for a sec, then it would rise again. And um, I tried watching some music. I said, maybe if I just indulge something. I watched some music videos. I watched some gorillas music videos. And... They were okay for a little bit. Like I could kind of get into them, but I just couldn't focus on anything. I couldn't comprehend what I was looking at. Um, now, obviously, you know, Gorillaz music videos nowadays are super trippy, but I just couldn't, I still couldn't record. I couldn't comprehend what I was looking at. Um, and just the anxiety was just, was just relentless. Um, so... Uh, I, I basically, through the course of that, 
I couldn't even remember what happened after that. I think I, I laid on, just laid in bed and watched, I think I watched some Jordan Peterson videos and then I, uh, think that was it. And then I slowly sort of drifted sleep. By that time it was like three in the morning. So it only lasted three hours, but it felt like an eternity. So the next day, I, I when I was a little bit more coherent, because I woke up the next day still feeling just like just like foggy brained, like I, I I did my taxes and did you know wash my car and did stuff, but I couldn't remember doing anything. It's like I did this and I didn't remember doing it after I did it. Just very foggy brain. I just couldn't focus. Um, and so I looked through my notes. I looked through what I had written down, and then I wrote down some other things that I could sort of barely recollect. And I compared those to things that I was, that was going on in my thought process. Ah, my thought process. So while, while I was high and for the past while, this was like sort of the, the typical thought process I went through when I would get high was you have autism you're schizophrenic you're you, well i don't want to say you're you're mentally handicapped and you just you're too stupid to know it and that would just repeat over and over again you're autistic you're you're schizophrenic you're insane you're in, you're mentally impaired and you're just so mentally impaired you can't even recognize it the world you know is not real your your you know your friends are not your friends they plot on you your, your your parent your family plots on you your you know just really really negative stuff so I, I i read through it and i compared what was happening and from what i could understand from the stuff that i could find my reaction was similar to the reaction of someone who does have schizophrenia. Um, you know, it's, I was reading that THC, especially for someone who is young, so like a teenager whose mind is still developing, it can, frequent use of that can cause, or it, it can cause schizophrenia in people who are genetically predisposed to schizophrenia. My, you know, in my family, I'm pre I'm genetically predisposed to Alzheimer's and dementia. It kind of runs in my family. So I thought, okay, well, if I'm predisposed to those things, I could potentially be predisposed to schizophrenia. And just based on the, the symptoms, I didn't, not everything didn't match. Not everything matched up. I wasn't visually hallucinating that time. But I wasn't able to focus on what I was looking at. Um, the internal negative talk was definitely like something that someone dealing with a, a psychotic, like dealing with psychosis or a schizophrenic psychotic episode might have deal with, dealt with. Now, I don't know anyone personally who had schizophrenia. Um, you know, I'm not saying if you have schizophrenia, there's something, you know, or any negative thing about that. I'm just saying what my experience is so as i was um going through that you know it it clicked those the mannerisms i was looking up for someone who is you know because men mental health in general from my understanding is a spectrum you've got your autism spectrum you've got your your narcissism spectrum you've got your um your your uh your psychopathy spectrum you've got your uh, schizophrenic spectrum x y and z there's all these spectrums bipolar spectrum all that stuff so um i was i thought that and this is obviously a complete self-diagnosis i've not spoken to anyone because i can't even really afford to speak to anyone about it right now but based on what i read it it it, it explained a lot of things about my mannerisms all throughout my life but especially and specifically with my interaction with THC that um, what I was going through was a form of psychosis and um, it correlates to certain traits and symptoms of schizophrenia. Now, 
where that all leads to is um, how CBD helped. So at the time when I was going through that like really, really bad high, I had completely forgotten I had CBD. That's how bad I literally forgot what I was doing. I forgot. I would think like, oh, man, let me try to get some CBD. Maybe that will help calm me down. I would forget that I had it and it was sitting on my dresser. That's how bad it was. So um, I the next day. So this is Friday. I'm still delirious. I'm still like, I just feel awful. And I try CBD gummy. Now the gummy I tried was an isolate CBD gummy. There was no other cannabinoids. It was just CBD. And that helped tremendously, tremendously. That calmed me down. It, it didn't, it wasn't, I would say from like a scale of one, it did nothing to 10. It like solved everything. It was definitely at like a seven or 7.5. Like it really, really helped. I'd say eight. I would put it at eight. It really helped calm me down. Um, so I just kind of kept eating them until, you know, I work in a hemp shop. So I get the stuff half off. Um, so the next day when I got um, an isolate tincture, which is what you would drop under your tongue and let it sit under your tongue and have it absorb through your um, sub, was it sublingual glands. Um, and that's, that's, that's helped a lot. But the point, the whole point with this whole story and me just explaining this is, um, it's, it's, it's funny how I had to, I was, I was always curious, why does this affect me? So in such a way, and I had to put myself in a very uncomfortable position. I did not want to do this THC gummy, but I wanted to know why does it affect me in this way? And in my opinion, the only way I could do that was I need to experience it, record what's happening so I can relay it to myself later. Because what often happens with THC, when I would forget what I did, I would completely forget what happened. And so I said, okay, well, I'm going to record this and now I know. But CBD was, was a tremendous, tremendous help. Um, it just, you know, it, and, and when I say CBD, I mean just CBD, broad or, or isolate. Um, so that was a big eye-opening thing because the 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 other schizophrenic traits or the other symptoms that i noticed are things that have occurred throughout my life over time like me being a teenager and being very reclusive um my tendency to sort of live in my own head most of the time um whether that's just like an intp thing or whatever it is um my tendency to just dwell in my head my uh, difficulties understanding other people's feelings and emotions and, and misreading circumstances and misreading situations, um, things like that. It just, it explained a lot of things. Um, now, obviously, like I said, this is all a self-diagnosis. I'm not going to run around saying I have schizophrenia. I have this, that, or the other. This is what's wrong with it. It's the, I've noticed a correlation and so I, you know, when I get to a point where I can afford to talk to someone about it, um, I want to, I will bring this thing, things up and then go from there. But, uh, I guess, I guess in two different ways of like having the suffering being imposed onto me, uh, well not onto me specifically, but, but having the suffering being out of my control and then having the suffering in a somewhat controlled environment so I can investigate it, record it, and then review it later. It's just been a lot of suffering and revel res rev revelation over the past couple of weeks. 
um and that's it's it's a it's a very interesting thing um that we're we're still learning about ourselves and understanding understanding our flaws and and flaws meaning like under, being able to take ourselves out of a situation and understand our mannerisms like from a bird's eye view take yourself out of the situation and look at the whole thing including yourself and see what is actually happening um that's particularly effective for me someone who who pretty much his whole life has lived in his own head and is now and i'm now trying to make a a very concentrated effort in allowing myself to be you know emotionally vulnerable not so vulnerable to be taken advantage of obviously but with close friends close family members and just allowing myself to feel and allowing myself to not just feel but express those feelings um crying <laughs> crying i must say crying can be one is one of the healthiest things you can do and I'm, i mean that it is one of the healthiest things you can do it is such a release and there's nothing wrong with crying there's nothing wrong with crying um and just expressing the and and letting expressing your feelings to other people letting people know how you feel um as someone you know, like me who lives in his own head i've always had issues with thinking people should just know how i feel and how the how excuse my french how the fuck are they going to know you how you feel if you don't tell them you know what i mean it's so obvious it sounds so obvious but in the moment it's act it can be very difficult Think about someone who you have very strong feelings towards, who you haven't expressed them to. It's uh, it's like, oh well, you know, it's uh, from from an uh, from a removed viewpoint. It's just like, oh well, just tell them how you feel. It's not the heart. But now think about someone who you have strong feelings towards. How would you express that to them? How would you genuinely express that to them? And how would you cope with the response if it's not what you think it is? If, if you if the response is you get rejected for expressing your feelings the thing with that and you know just rejection is like rejection is just confirmation there's in my opinion it's worse it is so much worse to sit around wondering wondering if someone will like you back wondering how they feel about you wondering Oh, maybe if I do this or, or maybe, maybe this meant this, or maybe this was a sign. No, no, that, that sucks. Telling them how you feel, just being like, look, this is how I feel about you. This is how I feel. I'm going to be straight up honest with you. This is how I feel. If they accept it, great. Wonderful. If they, and when I say reject, when they, when I say that, I mean like, when they don't feel the same way, when it is not compatible, it is not a mutual feeling. That confirmation, it stings. It stings. I know it stings. But it feels so much better after the sting. It feels so much better to just understand, okay, I know where we stand now. Now I can move on. Now I can move on. Um... Yeah, I just, I just, this has just been a very, this has been a lot of things that have happened in the past two weeks. Um, but I'm just, I'm really, I'm really grateful for, you know, the people who are in my life, uh, my friends, my family, you list for, for listening to this, um, you know, the people who watch my videos, you know, the people who look at my heart, just just pee you know i'm just i'm just thankful um and the last thing i want to i want to say before i sign off is letting people know how you feel there's just kind of like piggybacking off that don't don't wait don't wait don't hesitate because you don't know how long they're gonna be there there's so many people who hold grudges against 
other people like their family members um exes um you know former friends all you hold all these negative feelings and it doesn't it it doesn't go away it's going to keep manifesting and it's going to affect the way you deal with other people and it's going to affect the way you deal with yourself too you have to let people know how much you love them or how you feel about them even if you don't like them just be like listen i've i've always had this problem with you and i don't like that i have this problem with you and i want to talk I, I feel like i need to express this to you but i don't i'm not trying to like pick a fight but i just need you to know how i feel i think that that sort of communication it 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 sounds people are some people are gonna say that's so weak but it's not it takes so much strength to accept your feelings and express your feelings because the people who you want to express those things to might not always be there you might not get another chance to let them know how you feel you know if you wait around anything can happen and you don't want to be in that position where you're sitting around feeling bad for yourself and feeling bad that you didn't let them know how much you cared. You didn't let them know what you were thinking. You didn't let them know. So, anyway, I want to thank you for listening to this episode of the Better Late Than Never podcast. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Um, if your Sunday's over, I hope you enjoy your Monday and you enjoy the next week. Um, and yeah, uh, this is Scoo signing off. And yeah. <laughs>